Good evening. Welcome to India Global, your weekly wrap of the big international stories that impact India with detailed analysis and special guests. I'm Vishnu Shom. A quick look at the headlines. China continues to expand its footprint in the Indian Ocean. NDTV accesses exclusive satellite images of China building a new naval base in Cambodia. India confirms it will attend the Ukraine peace talks in Jeddah on the 5th and 6th of August. Saudi Arabia has invited Western nations as well as countries like Brazil and China to discuss Volodymyr Zelensky's 10-point peace plan. The Pakistan Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif announces early dissolution of the country's National Assembly. The opposition, led by the former Prime Minister Imran Khan, alleges that Sharif is running away from conducting free and fair polls. Sharif also bats for resumption of talks with India. India says talks and terror cannot go hand in hand. The former US President Donald Trump pleads not guilty in a Washington DC court to conspiring to overturn his 2020 election defeat. Trump now faces five more upcoming trials. And ocean temperatures touch a record high. The average daily global sea surface temperature beat a 2016 record this week. Well, China's growth as a maritime power has a direct impact on regional security and its balance in the Asia-Pacific region. From illegally claiming territory and building islands in the South China Seas to establishing its first overseas military base in Djibouti, Beijing is clearly out to increase its sphere of influence. The latest example of this is a new base in Cambodia being constructed by China. It's not too far from the critical Malacca Straits. That's the crucial waterway between East Asia and the rest of the Indian Ocean. What is China doing? How is India responding? We have this special report. It's these images of a new port being constructed with Chinese funds in Cambodia that are New Delhi's latest headache on a persistent threat, Chinese naval expansion in the Asia-Pacific region. The Riem base in Cambodia near Sihanoukville lies on the Gulf of Thailand and extends Beijing's military reach into Southeast Asia. It's not far from Singapore and therefore close to the strategic Malacca Straits, the gateway into the Indian Ocean. The base has striking similarities to this, China's first overseas base in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, a base with direct security ramifications for India. The Maxar satellite images you see here, first broadcast by NDTV, show a Chinese warship docked on the base, which continues to be under development. For India, the growing Chinese maritime presence represents a huge challenge. The Chinese Navy continues to grow faster than any Navy in the world, backed not just by quality warships, but also in staggering numbers. With more than 355 ships and submarines, the Chinese Navy is the world's largest. In the next three years, that number is expected to go up to 460 ships and subs. In addition to this, there are at least 85 patrol vessels, several armed with anti-ship cruise missiles. India competes with this huge presence with our geography, with a massive peninsula and the strategically located Andaman and Nicobar Islands. India is well positioned to monitor the waters of the Indian Ocean, not just through warships, but also maritime reconnaissance aircraft, such as the P-8 you see here. Closely aligned with the US, UK, France, Japan and Australia, New Delhi hosts several rounds of maritime exercises every year, including the Malabar exercises, some of the most sophisticated anywhere. Significantly, the images that you see here are of Agalega Island, a far-flung island that belongs to Mauritius but is being developed with Indian resources. In 2015, India and Mauritius signed an agreement to set up infrastructure for local inhabitants. But it's the development of the large airstrip with port facilities that lead many to believe that this may be a major Indian naval base in the future. For New Delhi, reinforcing alliances with Indian Ocean partners is critical. China has been doing that right on India's doorstep. The images you see here are from Hambantota port, where Beijing docked the Yuan Wang-6 last year, a large missile tracking ship, despite New Delhi's objections. The Yuan Wang eventually went away only to return to the Indian Ocean. It's sailing presently in the South Indian Ocean. 
India counters this Chinese influence by building up relations with New Delhi's close regional partners. Last month, Delhi decommissioned and transferred the guided missile corvette INS Kirpan to Vietnam, a move the Navy chief said was assurance to our friends and partners. India has also transferred this Russian-built submarine, the ex-INS Sindhuvir, to Myanmar. This is Myanmar's first and only serving submarine. Further afield, India has signed a $375 million contract with the Philippines for three batteries of supersonic BrahMos cruise missiles, among the most advanced in the world. These represent a direct threat to Chinese interests in the South China Sea. What remains clear, though, is that thousands of kilometers away from the contentious Himalayan boundary, India and China are in the midst of a serious battle for presence in the waters of the Indian Ocean. It's not just about establishing influence. A lot of it has to do with attempting to control waters through a key maritime route that connects the Far East with Europe. Vishnu Shob for NDTV. Well, joining us now, Admiral Arun Prakash, the former Chief of Naval Staff. Thanks, Admiral, very much for being with us. Uh, the Riam Naval Base, which has been constructed in Cambodia, not too far from Sihanoukville by the Chinese, it is, in, it is relatively close to the Malacca Straits. What are the implications for India? Well, um, firstly, uh, Cambodia used to be a neutral country. They, were, they had undertaken to, you know, not to get too close to China, but it seems that economic or other compulsions have forced them into the Chinese lap. So the Chinese are helping them build this port, um, which may be available to the PLA Navy for use when required. So I think there is no great cause for alarm, but there's certainly cause for reflection and for introspection on our part. Because for far too long, we've been focused on the micro issues. I mean, Eastern Ladakh, patrolling points, how many meters, across the LAC and issues like that. The big game is going to be played out at sea in the maritime sphere. And a very essential component of China's maritime, uh, China's great uh, dream, Xi Jinping's dream is the maritime component. And they've gone about it very um, meticulously and thoroughly. Each component of their maritime power has been looked at, whether it's shipbuilding, as you mentioned, they're prolific shipbuilders and soon um, the PLA Navy will, will be the biggest in the world. Shipbuilding, merchant shipping, fishing fleet, coast guard, they've got every aspect of maritime power. So this is one more component of, uh, of China's great maritime power that they've been contemplating. They, as far back as 2019 in their defense white paper, they had mentioned that they will be building or creating a series of overseas bases, which they need. What is their need? There are a number of issues that that justify what China is doing in their own con concept. One is that they are the world's biggest trading and manufacturing nation. And all their trade is, almost all their trade is seaborne. They need to protect it. They are also one of the biggest importers of energy. About 80 to 90 percent of their energy come from overseas. That needs to be protected. So any given day, there are maybe a hundred odd super tankers on the high seas, either heading for China or a Chinese port or heading back to the Gulf to refill. So all this needs protection. They have invested, I think, over a trillion US dollars in their Belt and Road Initiative. And they are, you know, uh, meticulously enticing smaller nations into their, uh, into their network. So all this requires uh, <clears throat> maritime heft. So this is part of their uh, grand strategy. And they, as I said, they've gone about it very meticulously and uh, very thoughtful. So Admiral, by, really, virtue, uh, by virtue of, of our strategic presence in the Arabian Sea, in the Bay of Bengal, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, our gigantic peninsula, uh, and our alliances in the Indian Ocean region, uh, how well placed are we to keep track of what China is doing? All right. So the point here is that we, we don't need to indulge in a tit for tat with China. We can't compete with them. They are competing with, with the USA. They, they, they're competing to become you know, a superpower sooner than later. So we need to, we are neither capable of, nor do we need to compete with them. We need to make sure that our interests out at sea, even on land, are not jeopardized in any way. And to that end, we have a very 
a compact but very competent and professional navy which can take care of our interests we are also as you mentioned reaching out to friends uh, in, in in the in the eastern waters in the, in the indo pacific vietnam philippines uh, myanmar uh, so we have established um, you know sound relationships in that area and we can make sure that our vital interests are not jeopardized by what china is doing and they they as you know are aiming to uh, achieve super power status which they will so we can neither afford to nor should we indulge in any kind of race with china at the same time we must make sure that we don't focus overly on on the land issues i mean that's a micro issue as i said the big the big competition is out at sea big competition for influence for power projection for balance of power whatever you call it we will be out at sea and we need to focus more and more on our maritime strength and by maritime strength i mean not just the indian navy but the whole gamut ship building merchant fleet coast guard fishing fleet under sea uh, you know exploration etc all these aspects need to be looked at uh, much more closely than we have been so far admiral three points which i did point out uh, you know in that report india's sale of supersonic brahmos missiles to philippines um the transfer of a submarine to myanmar their only one um and a, a frigate a, a corvette to vietnam how is this you know how are these important steps because it's not too often in the past where we've supplied weaponry to other countries the brahmos is as uh, as sophisticated a weapon as the indian navy possesses in terms of missiles how significant are these developments well so far china has been having its way in the south china see they invented this nine dash line and stake outrageous claims and when little philippines tried to protest against it and went to the international uh, tribunal uh, and won the case against china china with great contempt just dismissed it out of hand similarly they have problems with vietnam they have problems with most of the countries in in in, in the south china sea and they are small countries and china has the chinese foreign minister at one asean meeting at, at sorry at one uh, meeting in singapore just told somebody some country that you are a little country and we are big and that's how it is so they have been indulging in bullying and hegemonic uh, conduct and what india has done is to help its friends uh, to prepare themselves to stand up to china by providing the, the brahmos is a very potent missile i mean out at sea it can take out uh, any ship approaching similarly the the corvette corvette we've given to uh, uh, to vietnam is a guided missile corvette the submarine for myanmar is is also pretty solid so with these actions they are also symbolic whereas they are also actually strengthening our friend perhaps we could do more to to pass on hardware after all china has ruthlessly armed pakistan not with convention not just with conventional weaponry uh, weaponry but with also with nuclear weapons Sure. so we have not re- retaliated or responded as we should have but it's a good beginning i hope we carry on in this in this strain <laughs> admiral always a pleasure to speak to you thank you very much indeed sir thanks thank you prime minister narendra modi has confirmed his in person participation in the brics summit in johannesburg the summit will be hosted by south africa from the 22nd to the 24th of august this end speculation that the meet could be a virtual affair after russia's president vladimir putin decided not to attend According to uh, the External Affairs Ministry the South African President Cyril Ramaphosa extended a personal invitation and briefed Prime Minister Modi who's getting set to travel. Now ahead of the G20 summit um, and in an effort to showcase India's foreign policy achievements in the run up to the elections the senior minister hardeep puri has outlined key data points in showcasing where india is now compared to where we were in 2019 remember g20 is next month that's when all the global leaders uh, are scheduled to be here in delhi the point the government now wants to make uh, and it's not just with g20 in mind it's also in the run up to 2024 that india is on the cusp of becoming an even larger economic powerhouse here are some of the key points made by mr puri about what it was in 2014 uh, at 20 uh, and and what it is now so let's take a look at fuel price comparisons what this data suggests is that even in the worst years as a result of the ukraine crisis when fuel prices went up all over the world india's did go up by 2.36% compare that with pakistan we're talking about petrol here that went up by more than 50% canada by more than 24% the usa went up by more than 30.15% 
And let's take a look at diesel statistics uh, as well. In fact, let's move on now, take a look at GDP uh, diesel statistics over here. India's diesel prices did go up, uh, but it was at about 4.9%, uh, whereas countries like Pakistan went up to 40.81%, Canada to 21.2%, the USA to 29.31%. Compare 4.97% to Pakistan's 408 or even America's 29.31%. If you take a look at GDP numbers, and this is what we often hear about, the IMF says that India will be contributing 15% to global growth in 2023, this year alone. So that gives you an idea of how big India is emerging. Our GDP will cross 3.75 trillion this year alone. So that places us well into getting into that 5 trillion, 8 trillion, and ultimately 10 trillion league club as well. India's trade balance, now this is important. If we look at export and import statistics from 2014, compare that uh, with what it was earlier to what it is now. So in 2014, if you look at uh, the export statistics, 317 billion in terms of India's export. And if you look at it uh, presently now, let's just bring up the next point. Back in 2014, import was at 459.369 billion. So compare that with what it is now, and you'll see there's been a huge change indeed. It's up to 770 million billion for exports, and as far as imports, 892 billion plus. So that gives you an idea of how fast India's economy has really been growing. Well, let's turn our attention now to a huge concern in the United States, the transfer of the drug fentanyl to the USS narcotics fire, as it were. Four Chinese companies now face trafficking charges. The leading cause of drug overdoses in America are synthetic opioids, like fentanyl, as this report explains. You know, there was a time where the young people of our country would go to a party and we as parents would be concerned about whether they were smoking weed or drinking alcohol underage. Now what's happening at these parties is people are passing around pills. And these are pills that these kids may think are Adderall or Xanax and they are laced with fentanyl. The leading cause of drug overdoses in America is no longer cocaine, meth, or even heroin. It's synthetic opioids like fentanyl. But what exactly is fentanyl? It's a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. It's a drug that's relatively easy to produce for a better, cheaper hyperdose than heroin. There are two types of fentanyl, pharmaceutical fentanyl and illegally made fentanyl. Pharmaceutical fentanyl is prescribed by doctors to treat severe pain, especially for advanced stage cancer. Over the past few years, fentanyl and its analogues have appeared in the streets, often laced into the illicit heroin supply. US federal data also shows that fentanyl has also increasingly appeared in cocaine overdose deaths. Law enforcement officials believe that most of this fentanyl comes from labs in China. Right now, fentanyl is the leading cause of death among 18 through 42 year olds in our country. The leading cause of death. Adolescent deaths doubled because of fentanyl from 2019 to 2021, doubled. But while China continues to shirk responsibilities, the U.S. is actively looking for partnerships to curb the supplies of these dangerous drugs. During Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S., the two sides committed to strengthening the bilateral drug policy relationship and agreed to take more steps towards the commitment by treating addiction and disrupting the global trafficking of illicit drugs. But this as the extent to which fentanyl production takes place illegally in India still remains unknown. We believe the United States is a canary in the coal mine when it comes to fentanyl, an exceptionally addictive and deadly synthetic drug. Having saturated the United States market, transnational criminal enterprises are turning elsewhere to expand their profits. If we don't act together with fierce urgency, 
more communities around the world will bear, will bear the catastrophic costs. The rise in deaths involving heroin, cocaine and fentanyl is startling to experts with big implications for America's ongoing drug overdose crisis as well as for communities around the world. Parmeshwar Bhava for NDTV. Well, joining us now, Dr. Sri Parna Patak. She has tracked this very, very closely. She's an associate press, uh, professor at the Jindal School of International Affairs. Thanks very much, uh, Sri Parna, for, for being with us. You know, that story captured uh, what the concerns in America are. How is it getting from China to the U.S.? Thanks, Vishnu, for having me here. Um, it's basically through a lot of companies. You know, um, in this, this year, in June alone, you know, um, there were four companies which have their... In supplies from the from from the Chinese market, they have been sanctioned by the United States of America. Now China says that you know um, we've done enough, and now the problem in the U.S. is is its own doing. But of course, um, these are companies which operate legally or illegally from China. So the drugs are you know massively spread. They first reach the Mexican market, and then from Mexico it moves onwards into the U.S. So it's a big transnational link, and um, the biggest cause or the biggest supplier of fentanyl in the U.S. has been Chinese companies. Is there a sense that this is a drug which has been weaponized potentially by China, uh, something which has been somehow or the other uh, made to enter the U.S. market deliberately? This could very well be a weaponization of drugs because uh, you know China uses a lot of things for its geopolitical purposes. For example, um, the U.S. and China had an agreement on um, counter-narcotics. But then last year, China suspended all joint initiatives with the U.S. on narcotics when um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. So clearly for China, geopolitics trumps counter-narcotics cooperation. Also, given the fact that China has a huge network of surveillance, you know, um, companies have to be registered in China, and we know how the way the ways in which the Chinese economy works. The excuse that, um, you know, um, these companies are illegal and they are somehow operating, they're escaping the Chinese eye, it's a bit too far-fetched. So there is a big possibility that, um, you know, it's, it's actually being weaponized and the state actually knows of what is actually happening. What is the worry for India specifically? Is this something which can enter our country in, in, huge, in a significant amount? Definitely it can, because uh, India sadly is, um, you know, wedged between the world's two largest areas of illicit opium production, the Golden Crescent and the Golden Triangle. This proximity has traditionally been viewed as a source of vulnerability. And China supplies to both of these regions, Golden Crescent as well as the Golden Triangle. These are very well documented. In fact, India and China also have an agreement on counter-narcotics, which has just been lying still. There has been no movement forward. There are no talks. There are no discussions. It is definitely a very huge concern. If China can weaponize counter-narcotics with the U.S., which is currently the largest economic and military power in the international system, it can very well do that with India as well, which is uh, not at the best of its relations with China at the moment. All right. Well, Professor Patak, thank you very much for sharing You know those points. It's, it's a story that uh, is likely not going away and perhaps something we in India need to take very seriously indeed. Thanks very much. India has confirmed that we will participate in peace talks on the Russia-Ukraine war hosted by Saudi Arabia on the 5th and 6th of August. Saudi Arabia has invited Western countries, uh, as well as countries like Brazil and China, to discuss Volodymyr Zelensky, that's the Ukrainian president's 10-point peace plan. India has been invited to attend uh, a meeting hosted by Saudi Arabia on Ukraine in Jeddah. Um, I think it's on the 5th and 6th of this month. India will participate in this event and our participation is in consonance with our long-standing position that dialogue and diplomacy is the way forward. All right, well, that's it then uh, on India Global. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be focusing extensively on the forthcoming G20 summit. It is a huge event, not just for India, but for several countries around the world that look to India uh, in so many levels. We'll be looking at all of those and a lot more. Do stay tuned.